let me be the first to welcome you to the 919th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Leaders of Boston. My name is Tom McDonough, I'm the president, and it's, I'm really happy to see everyone here, a lot of new faces, hopefully new members, but guests, uh, non-members are certainly welcome also, so it should be a great night. And um, before we go any further, I just wanted to to go through, uh, we're really excited to have Calvin here tonight. He's going to be t speaking of testing quantum mechanics with cosmic photons on the Canary Islands. And that should be really exciting. I've never been to the Canary Islands, so. I, can I, I understand the Canary Islands part of that yeah. one. <laughs> quantum photons, I'm not too sure about, too. But I'm sure Calvin's going to take care of that. Of course, you never had the cosmic photon either, right? Never. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, to move forward, our agenda is pretty packed today. So uh, we'll start with the secretary's report. We have the observing committee report with Glenn and Bruce. Megan. Go ahead, Glenn, kick it off. <laughs> I usually do kick things off in the best way. Uh, another uh, quotation I got from uh, Jim Mullaney, I became an astronomer not to access the facts about the sky, but to see and feel its majesty. I think those of us who are observers will all agree with that. And you're the one that can introduce this slide, because that's you. Well, um, thanks, Glenn. Uh, this is an image that uh, I was able to acquire at RAL, which is the Atmob Research and Imaging <coughs> Observatory. Thank you. Uh, um, you didn't even know where you were? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was in West Florida, Groton, not too sure. But uh, last weekend we had really nice weather and um, a number of people, John and Steve and a bunch of people were out there. Uh, Joe Henry was out of control. <laughs> he said, well, you know, here, take a look at M51 and NGC 4546 and the Sombrero Galaxy. And I'm like, well, I can do that. And so I went and I imaged all those. And this is one of those that I did take. And it's a very crude uh, image. Uh, it's not been calibrated or anything like that. But what it does show is that the, the observatory is really up and running. The mount, which is new this year, uh, Bruce and Jim have done a fantastic job of putting that together. We have the C14 on there, we have a, a, an APO 102 millimeter, and we have a 80 millimeter APO that uh, are available to, for the members to use. We're working on generating calibration uh, files for that, such that you can take much better pictures than this. And we're just waiting on great weather. Um, so I'm really excited about it. There's little things we have to tweak here and there, but it's coming along. So feast your eyes on M51 there. So not perfect. If you look close, you can see dust motes, and well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> um, and so, Glenn? Okay. You think back in the 60s or 70s, that would have been state-of-the-art astrophotography. All right, again, we had a lot of morning things happening here. So if you were a late riser, you're going to miss a few things. But on April 11th, Mercury will be, that was actually this morning, it said it's greatest elongation, but it's very low in the sky. You need a wide open horizon to be able to see much of anything. Rich is nodding, did you, did you get up at four in the morning? No, before? no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> April 23rd in the morning, Jupiter's listed 2 degrees from the waning crescent moon. That's a nice pair. And I think that you jump in about the red spot. Is that still pretty? Uh, oh, well, I sent out a, a, dis a disgust list. I know uh, after the response last uh, month with the people moaning and groaning about getting up early, Jupiter's transiting early in the morning now, um, right before sunrise. And so there are maybe a, a half a dozen opportunities to see the red spot transiting the central meridian of Jupiter if you're an early to rise kind of, uh, kind of person. The red spot is very vivid this year. It was last year and really pretty easy to see in almost any size telescope. You just have to know when to look for it. So I'll continue to send those you know, announcements out through the discuss list and uh, just to encourage you folks to get out there and observe it. Um, it's, it's, you can, it's very dark and very orange. It looks like an orange jelly bean on the planet. So it's kind of fun. So if you've never seen the red spot before, you should go out and do it. Thank you. And a few days later, Saturn's going to pair up with the waning crescent moon. As I've said in the past, this is a great opportunity for beginners who don't know what to find things in the sky. We can all find the moon, so if it's next to a planet, that kind of makes it easy for them. On May 6th, Eta, or Eta, 
Aquarian meteor shower is going to be a peak activity. This is kind of a tough one because the radiance is very low. So we only see about half of the meteors. Uh, but the moon will be kind of out of the way, so it would be a good opportunity to check those out. We might see about 20 an hour. I think uh, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can see up to 60 an hour, but we're going to see fewer. But if you just want to go outside and say that you did something worthwhile with your life at 4 or 5 in the morning, there you go. And Bruce is going to talk about the next one. He was kind enough to let me know about this, and he inserted this. So Lord, the floor is yours, sure, Bruce. So uh, on the night of Friday, May 10th, sat Saturday morning, um, between about 8.15 local time and 1.15 in the morning, uh, the moon is going to be passing through the Beehive Cluster. And there's going to be 16 notable lunar occultations. Now, back in the day, people would do lunar occultations so that they could help define the profile of the moon. But what, what the, uh, and this is a, a kind of a pro-am effort here, what we're interested in now is trying to discover any spectroscopic double stars. So. I thought I would have um, some charts with the times and everything for um, for our location at the Westford Clubhouse by tonight's meeting. I do I don't have them. Uh, I um, I had to have somebody else generate them for me. But if anybody's interested in this, you can visually observe them. Uh, if you have equipment or uh, even with GPS timing, I can let somebody borrow my equipment. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting to watch these stars wink in and out as they pass by the moon's profile. And uh, I actually helped discover with, um, with somebody over at the Clay Observatory a uh, previously, what we think was a previously unknown spectroscopic double just by this very technique. So um, I will put some stuff out on the announce list once I have the information ready. Thank you, Bruce. How many of you have seen an occultation before of a star? It's a fascinating event. It's kind of tough sometimes. Um, if the dark side of the moon occults the star, you can see that blink out right away. And I've always thought it's interesting. Toward the end, it looks like this thing is falling into the moon. It looks like the moon is standing still. The tougher part is the egress if it's on the bright side of the moon. And even if it's the dark side, I never quite catch that. Usually I'm looking, and I'm looking, oh, there's a star there, and I missed it. And even the disappearance, and if you've done this before, you know you want to blink your eyes. But you know if you blink your eye, when you open it, there's the star is gone. So I'm like this, my eyes are watering. <laughs> it's a tough thing, but it's a real blast to watch these. And one of the most interesting ones I saw was the double star Gamma Virginis. And it was blink, blink like that, because it was a double star. And uh, it was a beautiful sight to see. So if you've never seen an occultation like that, give it a shot. Those are fun to look at. Yeah, one of, one, uh, so well, my first one was actually uh, first of many was in a parking lot at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Kelly, in fact, you were there, wherever Kelly is. Uh, we were out in the parking lot, and there was a lunar, I think it was Antares. Oh. And it was, uh, it was a grazing occultation, I remember. So instead of just the star disappearing, it was following the profile of the moon. You could see it wink in and wink out. And thanks for having that. We'll, we'll have that next month as well, so it's a heads up. You've got a month and a day uh, to get ready for this thing. And finally, I think this is fine, the observing challenge for April, a couple of galaxies that are just above uh, the, the question mark in Leo the Lion, uh, NGC 2964, 2968, they're galaxies, here they are here in a Mario Mata image. Uh, 2964 is the brighter one, it's, an, it's kind of a slanted spiral, and this is a lenticular galaxy right here. And up in here is tw NGC, you gotta look at these numbers, 2970, which is an elliptical galaxy, but it's about 13th magnitude. This is 11.3, <coughs> this is 11.9. Um, I think I've seen these with Steve's <coughs> telescope. But it might have been the two faint fuzzy blobs that were the March challenge objects. There were two different ones there. But I think they both look just like small, almost like elliptical galaxies, but they were visible in Steve's 18-inch scope. The other one, NGC 20, 370, or 2970 rather, is about 13th magnitude, so it will almost look stellar. Yes? Well, and I had my 10 inch scope up at the clubhouse a week, two weeks ago, and I could see them quite clearly with a 10 inch scope. Yeah. So they're, they're, you know, when you think about NGC galaxies, you think of something that's probably going to be fairly faint, but these were actually not so, not so bad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure I did see them with you guys, because they were easy. The other two that I was kind of joking about, 2300 was pretty similar to these. But the other one was 2976. 2276. Yeah, and it was really tough to see. It was very hard. So uh, again, give them a shot. And I think that, I forget now if we had other slides after this. If that's, yeah, yeah, we'll turn over to Steve. So 
Keep looking up. Thank you. Well, it's not to close the meeting, but I, I'd like to take this time to um, to welcome uh, Calvin Roy, who uh, is a graduate student in the, in the Department of Physics at MIT. And it's an exciting day for physics in general. As everyone knows, we have the announcement of an image of a black hole. I'm still kind of confused about how we can image black holes, but um, maybe Calvin can answer some questions related to that, too on top of his topic today, where he's going to speak of testing quantum mechanics with cosmic photons on the Canary Islands. And uh, he's a physics and math major. He was a physics and math major from Harvey Mudd College, where for his undergraduate thesis, he developed a unique astronomical instrument which used photons from quasars to generate random bits. Um, he was also a crucial member of the team led by uh, Anton Zellinger at the University of Vienna and David uh, Kaiser at the MIT that used some of the world's largest optical telescopes on the Canary Islands to conduct rigorous tests of quantum entanglement. Okay. Um, he is passionate about science communication and enjoys teaching in his spare time. He likes to play the cello and watch silly YouTube videos. <laughs> and that's another thing that we both have in common. So thank you very much, Calvin. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Very much. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Tom for having me here. And I'd like to thank Ricky in particular for introducing me to this, uh, this group. Uh, it's really good to be here, uh, and I'm excited to present the results, these results to you here today. Um, this work is based on um, work I did as an undergrad, um, work I did in my year between undergrad and grad school, and work that is sort of wrapping up today as I start graduate school here at MIT. Um, this is a unique project that aims to test quantum entanglement under um, different sets of assumptions. Um, that we sort of move into a future where quantum entanglement is at the heart of things like quantum communication, quantum computers, and other quantum technologies, we sort of want ways to certify that entanglement is really there. Um, and I, so I hope that you come away from this talk learning not just some, about some cool experiment we did, but also having some sense of intuition um, for how to think about quantum entanglement. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Um, so the title of my talk is Improving Bell Tests with Astronomical Observations. The first question is, what are bell tests? Um, it turns out that uh, there is a way to quantify it, uh, whether a system like you know you have two atoms or something, whether it's entangled or not. Um, so a physicist named John Bell in 1964 quantified this. Uh, he came up with a mathematical statement about the amount of correlation you can have between two particles, um, two photons, two atoms, two electrons, in, any, in sort of any um, arbitrary state. Um, and it turns out that if you have, the, if these two particles are entangled together, then the amount of correlation they'll, um, they'll exhibit under this particular like metric, like you calculate a score essentially for each pair of two particles, and if your two particles are entangled, you will violate that, um, that upper limit that you can set. <coughs> and so this is great because this gives us a way to quantify whether these two particles are entangled or not. If you calculate this number for the two particles and they exceed what's classically allowable, then you know that your system's entangled. <coughs> the issue here is that in 2010, oh, um, in 2010, a physicist named Michael Hall came along, and Michael Hall actually found out a way, figured out a mechanism by which classical physics can reproduce those quantum correlations, those correlations that are persistent in the quantum world um, in a way that they cannot possibly be classically. I'm going to explain this, um, this framework for you today with an analogy. Um, there's, it's like I have a really slick casino game that is actually maps onto the experiment that we performed. Um, and I'm going to just go through this for you today. So in this game, you have a pair of players named Alice and Bob. Um, they're going to play this game, and they're, going to they're working together to beat the house. They each have one of these big dice here, which you can see has three blue faces on them and three red faces on them. And so they're going to take these dice, 
they're going to walk to opposite ends of the casino. And then these dice are eventually going to represent our quantum particles, which might be entangled and might not. Um, so how does this game work? They take these dice, they go to the opposite ends of the casino, and at opposite ends of the casino, they're going to meet a dealer. Each dealer is going to flip a quarter. And then Alice and Bob will roll the dice. Now how do, you, how do they win this game as a team? If the quarter comes up heads, the dealer will read the color of the dice face from the, from the top, as you normally would. With tails, the dealer will read from the front. The dealers are going to write down that result, and they're going to bring them together to see if Alice and Bob will win. So in this particular game I've drawn here, Alice's dealer is going to read from the front. So Alice's dealer is going to see red, and Bob's dealer will also see red, because Bob's dealer is reading from the top of the dice. They bring the results together, and it turns out that you win the game uh, if your colors match. So Alice and Bob have won this particular game. But there's a catch. If both quarters come up tails, in the case where both dealers read from the front, then matching colors actually makes you lose. Another way to summarize this is as follows. So remember, there are two quarters flipped on opposite sides of the casino. Um, they're sort of done so in separate rooms. And then if both of them come up tails, then matching colors makes you lose, and having different colors makes you win. But with any other possible combination of those quarters um, landing, if that, you know, there are three of them, let's sit here, then matching colors makes you lose. Now, if you roll these dice randomly, it turns out that you win 50% of the time. <coughs> because there's a 50% chance of matching, <coughs> and there's a 50% chance of winning this game, and a 50% chance of losing this game. Now, can anyone think of a strategy by which Alice and Bob might win this game as often as they can? Let's say they can like, make these dice land however they want. Um, they can arrange, okay, I want blue to be here, blue to be here, red to be here, blah, blah, blah. So how did Alice and Bob win this game as often as possible? Does anyone have a particular? Mm -hmm. By cheating or not? Yeah, by cheating. So let's say they can they have the power to arrange these dice however they want. They don't need to roll them. They can just put them down on the table after seeing how the quarters are. Does anyone think of a strategy by which? They call each other or text each other. <laughs> right. So that's actually not allowed. So they're on opposite sides of the casino, and let's say like they have no cell phone service. That's, actually, that's a really good point. And I'm really glad you brought that up. We'll get back to that. So they place it so that they pick a color to match either red or blue, and they make it so that there's always the same color on the top and on the front. Yeah. Right, exactly. So if you place, um, so if you place your dice like this, you know, you choose a color red or blue, which is blue. Then in this case, no matter how the quarters come up, both dealers will always see blue, right? And if both dealers always see blue, then you'll win these three scenarios, and you'll lose this fourth one. And so, in that case, you win this game 75% of the time, which is a lot better than what you naively do by rolling these dice like um, unskilled gamblers. So you win this game 75% of the time. Do we get to split the winnings, you and I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, know, you can win. Uh, so it turns out this is the best you can do, um, turns out this is the best you can do classically. Um, but this game actually has a uh, correspondence with an experiment um, with the experiment that we did, which is going to be about test. Uh, in this experiment, you don't interrogate two dice, but you interrogate a pair of entangled photons. How do you make these entangled photons? Well, photons are just particles of light. So you take a laser, you shine it into some special crystal, and occasionally, that special crystal will eat up one of these ultraviolet purple photons and spit out two photons of each with half the energy. So they're infrared photons. You can't see them, but you can send them towards uh, two different sides of a casino or somewhere where you can play this game. Um, those photons, we're going to interrogate their polarization, uh, which is sort of a property of the light. If I had a, I had a pair of sunglasses, um, actually, you can't really see my laptop, but uh, yeah. yeah. So, I have, anyone else have polarizing sunglasses here? So, like, uh, it turns out light is. The light coming off my laptop is polarized. Um, 
as you know, light is just an electric field. The LCD projector might be polarized. Yeah, let's see the LCD projector is polarized. Let's do an experiment. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Not really. Um, if you get really close, it'll, it'll help. Yeah, I also. Close to the screen. Like this. Yeah, so, oh, looks a little fire finish, actually. Um, but it's a little more obvious on my laptop screen. Uh, so light is just um, a traveling electric field wave. You know, the electric field either goes from side to side or up and down or some mixture. And these sunglasses only let through the polarization that's going left and right. And so if I put it in front of my computer screen, you might be able to see if you're up close, especially that. Um, yeah, that's the amount of light getting through the glasses changes when I rotate the glasses around. I think you don't see anything when it's like this, and you do see a lot when um, when I sort of rotate it 90 degrees off. And that just reflects the fact that the light coming out of my computer screen is oscillating, and you know the electric field lines are going like this. And so when I point my glasses perpendicular to that, you actually don't get any light. Through. So you can take light and break it down into these two components, horizontally and vertically polarized which correspond to the directions that that electric field is oscillating around it. Um, of course, you don't need to break light down along those two axes. You can also break it down along different axes. So I can either describe my light as 50% horizontal plus 50% vertical, or 100% diagonal. Um, and so I can sort of interrogate each of my little packets of light, each of those entangled photons coming through, with something really similar to my glasses. It's called a polarizing beam splitter. Um, instead of just absorbing all the photons that are polarized in orthogonally to the glasses, it actually reflects them a different way. And so by looking at transmissions and reflections of these beam splitters, I can sort of map that onto reds and blues coming out of my dice. That's how, I, that's how my photons will answer the question. That's how they present, you know, present dice rows. And of course, I have two polarizing beam splitters, so I can interrogate both of the photons <coughs> that I make. And the, what do the quarters correspond to? The, cor the quarters in my game correspond to different orientation angles of my sunglasses or my polarizing beam splitter. So I can make a measurement of the photon in a sort of a rotated basis uh, and see whether it transmits or reflects, and I'll get a different result. Just like how when I took my glasses and put them in front of my computer screen, I got varying amounts of transmission and reflection. So we can put this all together. Um, it turns out that um, you can you want to ask the two photons on each side of the um, on each side of the experiment different questions because you have two quarter flips and those quarter flips correspond to different angles that you would measure those photons from, just like how you would interrogate the dice from different sides. Um, and it turns out that if you choose these magic angles zero and twenty two point five degree on Alice's side and forty five and sixty seven degrees on Bob's side, uh, you have sort of a a great setup where you can, these photons will actually win that, that casino game 85% of the time. So this is classically impossible, but it's something we see in quantum mechanics. And you can take all these, all these angles and sort of feed them into a quantum mechanical calculation, and you can calculate that the probability of winning is actually the cosine squared of 22.5 degrees. That's obvious, right? Um, <laughs> um, but the point is it violates this classical upper bound. That's how we know that our two photons are entangled. If we see 85%, then this is sort of a smoking gun of entanglement, uh, that there's something, there's something going on that cannot be explained by any arbitrarily complicated dice model. Um, you, know, you can arrange the dice however you want, but you cannot get 85% on average. Whereas in the quantum world, this is, this is possible and observed in many experiments. And so the thing that Michael Hall came along with in 2010 is what we call the freedom of choice loophole. Um, this is a mechanism by which you can sort of cheat at this game uh, in order to reproduce 85% with classical dice. And this is how that works. Let's take that strategy we had earlier, where we um, arrange the dice to come up blue every single time. And let's consider the possibility that Alice can somehow predict how Bob's quarter is going to come up. This is sort of like what you mentioned earlier with the phone call. If Alice can call Bob, then they can communicate, and they know which of these scenarios they're in. But in this case, they can't, let's say they can't communicate with each other. But if Alice has some, some weird way of like, you know, some crystal ball, you know, the day before they play the game, they can, they can sort of predict how the view of those quarters are. You um, might wonder why this doesn't happen. Uh, but if this were possible, then Alice can unilaterally um, 
if she can predict how bombs burn from land, she can essentially change their win strategy. And so they can win all of these flipped games where they win um, with tails, tails. Um, and so they can win more than 75% of the time. And so 85% is easy if this mechanism were allowed. So Feynman actually has something to say about this um, in his paper where he introduced quantum computing. Um, I think this is a great quote, so I'm just going to read that out. Uh, we have an illusion that we can do any experiment that we want. We all, however, come from the same universe, have evolved with it, and we don't really have any real fear. For we obey certain laws that have come from a certain past. So is it somehow that we are correlated to the experiments that we do so that the apparent probabilities don't look like they ought to look if you assume they're real? And so Feynman is essentially, what Feynman is saying is this. Um, here's a space-time diagram of our experiment. Um, this is a this is a common physicist, but I'll unpack it for you. Um, on this diagram, we have two axes, time and space. Time is scrolling upwards, so every event in, you know, so time is always scrolling upwards, and moving objects will go scroll left and right. And so we have two photons traveling at the speed of light, going in opposite directions, just like our players in our casino. They will sort of be emitted here at some location in space time, and one will go this way, and one will go that way. And because information travels at the speed of light, anything in sort of this red region down here can influence exactly what happens here. Because there's time for information to travel here, slower than the speed of light. It moves in some small amount of space in some large amount of time. If it's slower than the speed of light, it'll be in this red cone here. And it can actually influence what's going on here and potentially in the future as well. Um, in our game, we flip a quarter. And then we make a measure. Our quarter flips are shown in blue. There's a random bit drawn. We rotate our polarizing beam splitter, and then a photon comes in and either transmits or reflects at that beam splitter. And what Feynman is saying is this. Well, at the end of the day, there is some quarter flip or some quantum random number generator, but there's just some physical process there. And that physical process is going to depend on whatever happens in its backwards light cone, that region of influence of everything in the universe that could possibly have affected that. And Feynman was pointing out that, you know, if you look at these cones, the, the red one, the blue one, they actually, they actually overlap quite a lot. And so this is kind of bad news because Alice created, Alice's, the photon Alice created here could have been influenced by something in this purple region. And Bob's random number generator could also have been influenced in this purple region. This is, there's like a common cause, if a, a common cause could sit back here and essentially tip off Alice, how Bob's random number generator is going to come up. And then Alice can unilaterally change the results of the game in order to win 85% of the time. Of course, Bob has that same you know, geometric effect here. Now, so this purple region actually, um, if you work out the geometry, extends just four milliseconds before this experiment. So four milliseconds before we switch on our laser, make our entangled photons, and send them to opposite sides of a casino to do this experiment, there could have been a common cause that um, mimics the predictions of quantum mechanics without relying on um, you know, the framework of quantum theory. So this is like a classical explanation for quantum theory. So our answer to this is, of course, to use astronomy. Um, let's say, instead of flipping quarters or using a quantum random number generator, we take two telescopes, point them at quasars on opposite ends of the universe. Um, and use those quasars as sort of random bit, random number generators. Then that, that random number is sort of set deep in the cosmic past, not the milliseconds before we perform our experiment. And the geometry of our space-time diagram actually change a lot. Instead of something like this, where a common cause could have, could have acted merely four milliseconds before we switch our laser on, we get a scenario like this, where the random bits are generated deep <coughs> in the cosmic past, travel for a long period of time to our experiment, before we measure our photon, entangled photons created in the lab. And you can see those purple regions have been pushed back to maybe tens of billions of years ago. And so any common cause which is still acting and trying to mimic quantum mechanics suddenly has to be much, much stronger. It has to be able to engineer how this quasar is spitting out random quarter flips and also has to be telling Alice's photon what that quarter flip is going to be sort of communicate that over cosmic time. So this is like almost a super deterministic sort of universe. We did this experiment. Um, turns out that one of the only places in the world with two telescopes big enough 
um, to look at these high redshift quasars is the Canary Islands. This is the island of La Palma. Um, it's about a three hour flight from Madrid, um, and it's off the coast of Morocco. Um, the island itself has great weather, but on the mountaintop, it's kind of dry. Um, they want it that way for low humidity, and you know, they're all strong for so this. So I'll sort of unpack this diagram here. Um, at the center here, this is our source of entangled photons. We're not using the telescope dome in the middle here. We just have a little shipping container that we rented um, from some container company on the island. We put all, all of our optics in there, and we generate entangled photons inside that laboratory. Right? We send those entangled photons over hobby telescopes, um, about 500 meters on each side, to opposite sides of our casino, which in this case turns out to be two different mountain tops. Alice's photon goes this side, and oh well, I guess it's backwards here. So Alice's photon goes this way, and Bob's photon goes. At the same time, we commandeer two of the world's largest telescopes, the Telescopio Nazionale di Galileo uh, on this side, and the William Herschel Telescope on this side, in order to stare at two quasars whose light was emitted, you know, I think seven billion years ago. And while those photons were streaming in from the cosmos, they were generating random bits, and we were playing this entangled photon game with the rotating beam splitters, um, and we were sort of measuring how often they win this game. Uh, I think one of the most interesting parts of this experiment is um, how we generate those random bits. Uh, this is what I did my undergraduate thesis on, and that's something that the Vienna group built on in order to make this experiment happen. So we have this big telescope um, that has a four meter aperture, mm -hmm. a four meter primary mirror, um, and we're collecting a bunch of photons from it. It brings it to a Nasmith focus on this table here. Uh, and so we have essentially a place for starlight to come in or quasar light to come in. And I don't know if you can see here in this photo, but there's sort of this round filter wheel, um, which essentially has a bunch of dichroic mirrors inside. What dichroic mirrors are is they um, sort of let all the red photons pass and let the blue, make and reflect all the blue photons this way. And simultaneously, we have two single photon counting detectors, one that detects all those red guys and one that detects all those blue guys. And if we get a red one, we call that a one. If we get a blue one, we call that a zero. And those are quarter flips. It's a biased quarter, because there are not exactly as many red photons as blue photons. But it's still a random quarter. And this quarter was flipped 7 billion years ago, which I think is really cool. Um, here's a schematic of the same process. You have starlight coming in, or quasar light coming in. But you also have some other uh, sorts of noise sources. You have local, you sort of have a few local quarters creeping into your stream of uh, cosmic, cosmic random bits. Uh, you have straight light coming in from light pollution. There's not a whole ton of it on La Palma. Uh, this, I think the sky brightness is like 21st, 22nd, so it's really pretty. You can see the Milky Way in like five minutes standing outside uh, up on the mountain top. But there is still some straight light, and this is actually our dominant source of error. There's also dark counts on each of our detectors. Uh, since our detectors are not at absolute zero, there are sort of thermal fluctuations making the making the electrons jiggle around, and occasionally the electrons cause an avalanche. <coughs> the avalanche makes it look like there was a photon detecting being detected, um, but whereas in reality it wasn't a real photon. So there are sort of dark counts in each of our detectors. Um, and there's also a little bit of crosstalk between the two channels due to optical imperfections, but those turn out to be negligible. And so from all of our measurements, we can sort of conclude that of the photons entering each of our random number generators, 14% um, of them are local on Alice's side, and 6% of them are local on Bob's side. And so there's an overall, pro overall probability of cheating at this game of the sum of those two numbers, right? If Alice cheats sometimes and Bob cheats sometimes, then twice of sometimes is the total number of times that we cheat. So you add those probabilities together. And you can actually compute how often you expect these photons will win this, this entanglement game uh, if, you if you allow them to cheat at 21% of the time. You calculate this in the same way you would calculate your final score in a, you know, in a class. If you cheat on 21% of, of the exams and you get 100% on all of those and you get a C on all the other exams, then you can calculate what your grade in the class is going to be. It's going to be about a B minus. Um, then this is what what you sort of expect from your experiment um, if you do, if you assume that uh, you know, everything's sort of gone right. We played this game about 100,000 times with 100,000 different pairs of entangled photons. Um, our laser is always spitting out photons, and there's always entangled photons being generated. And so we just turn it on for a while and let it collect data and turn it off and analyze what happens. We bring those results together. 
And we observed an 81.3% win rate, uh, which is unexplainable. <coughs> Even if we allowed those, um, every single locally flipped quarter to contribute to that um, uh, Alice predicting Bob's quarter mechanism. And so this is uh, in tension with classical physics at a significance of nine sigma. Uh, and this allows us to rule out these sort of, this sort of common cause explanation within the, the past eight billion years of cosmic time. Uh, compare this to the best terrestrial experiments whose size sort of give uh, you four milliseconds. That's what the previous best thing happened, but we pushed this back to eight, eight billion years. So it's, we're sort of using, using the cosmos as our random number generator um, in order to test quantum entanglement. Um, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I have a bunch of cool photos on the island that I'd like to share with you. Um, because performing an experiment uh, outside the lab in the real world is sort of difficult, um, and we had a lot of a lot of fun. One thing I think you guys would appreciate here's a photo of the um, the TNG uh, Galileo National Telescope. Uh, its mirror is probably 3.6 four meters, um, and on the back of the mirror there are all these there are all these actuators. Each of these things uh, deforms that primary mirror, so you can actually have diffraction limited imaging. Um, at in near infrared with both wavelengths. And what really impressed me is just like the amount of cable management these guys have to do. I mean, look at, look at this. It's just like, this is so professional. I was so impressed by this. I had to take a picture of it. Um, this, isn't, this isn't adaptive optics, but this is what I call active optics. I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really a professional astronomer myself. I just like building things. Uh, so so these, these things don't compensate themselves in real time, but if you characterize them you're very carefully, um, I'm aware that you can sort of program each of these things individually in order to correct for aberrations on your mirror. Um, here is our entanglement source. Uh, you can sort of see the purple glow from our pump laser here. And there's a little, up here there's a tiny little crystal um, that takes those purple photons and turns them into two daughter photons. And those two daughter photons are collected in these optical fibers here. You can see this yellow thing coming up here and another one is sneaking up here. Uh, so we collect those entangled photons through a series of mirrors that reflect some of them this way and allows other ones to pass through the this mirror. The photons in this optical fiber and these, this optical fiber are then sent out to Alice and Bob um, 500 meters away over um, a pair of hobby telescopes. You just have a hobby telescope on one side sending the photons and the other, on the other side collecting the photons. Here's our receiver. Um, you can see that we have sort of a, you know, we have sort of this cage on the outside. This cage is here, and normally there's sort of a, a black hardware material on the six walls of this cage that, to reduce stray light. But this giant mirror here collects those photons and sent from the entanglement source and routes it through this, um, this metal box here. This metal box is what we call a hot cell. That's what does the fast rotating of the beam splitter. Um, there's not a physical beam splitter being rotated, but there's a little crystal here that can rotate the polarization of the photon. And so rotating the photon itself is equivalent to rotating the beam splitter in the opposite direction. And so that's how we implement the rotation really, really fast. We can actually arrange the experiment such that um, those, those photons are generated. And right before, right before they arrive at the detectors, um, you, you, can rotate the, um, you can rotate the polarization, or you can rotate the polarizing beam splitter. And so what that allows you to do is that, like, the photons have no way of predicting how you'll orient your polarizer. Um, so while it's in flight, you'll, you'll uh, arrange that. And so you need, you need to be able to rotate your polarization really fast. And that's what this, uh, this box here accomplishes. Um, there are a lot of other, other telescopes um, up on the mountaintop. Uh, here's one of them. It's really cool. I think, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. But you can sort of see there's this like, mirror thing. Um, and I think this. This detector is um, just a lot of collecting area to see cosmic ray showers, um, or the optical byproducts of cosmic ray showers. They generate a bunch of particles, and you see a bunch of light here and collect it with a big light bucket. Um, and you can sort of see see some other small telescope in the reflection, so I thought this was a pretty cool picture. This is a picture of the William Herschel Telescope, which is the other four meter telescope we used uh, to perform this experiment. Uh, I don't exactly know how it's mounted, uh, but it brings, it's the, this is a telescope where the light is brought onto the table, um, even though you have this big telescope sort of pointing all over the sky. Um, and this is the other telescope. 
you can see our little green box here. This is where the this is where the entangled photons are set to. And we just have two long cables extending from the telescope telescope um, uh, from the random number generator somewhere inside this dome that sort of hang outside here. We can't really see them, but they, they are fed into the back of this little green tripping container that we rented um, in order to rotate the green splitter to the, exactly the right angle that we want. Um, I'd like to thank all my collaborators for making this happen. Um, I put sunglasses on all my advisors because I think they're really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of all I got for you today. Um, so thanks for having me. I have a couple more slides on how are we doing on time. We're good? Okay, I have no idea how, for how long I've been talking. Um, so this is sort of how we uh, imagined things with Joe. Um, this experiment happened last year in early 2018. Um, so in December 2017, we sort of flew to the island. Our lab is based in Vienna, so we had to fly to the island in order to um, perform this experiment. So we would, the plan was we would fly there uh, for a test run and make sure all the quantum stuff was working. We would use local random number generators um, to sort of do an end-to-end -end test of the system, make sure that we were winning this game 85% of the time. Uh, and then on the 23rd of December, we would fly back to Vienna for the holiday. And then some holiday parties would happen, and then you wouldn't really remember exactly what happens. Um, <laughs> but then on January 5th, we would fly back to the island. And on January 7th through 9th, we would have um, two hours of observing time, simultaneously on those two enormous telescopes, um, to look at two quasars on opposite sides of the universe. And we'd have three chances on the 7th and 8th. Um, what happened wasn't exactly that, because on December 15th, uh, there was an enormous windstorm on the island. Um, you can sort of see the, the animals and nemometer plots, the wind vane things, the spinny things on the buildings. Uh, and you can see that the wind speed is sort of shooting through the roof almost literally here. Um, and so on the 15th of December, we received a call from the front desk saying that, um, you know, we heard a big bang. Uh, and we, we looked at the webcam and we noticed that the Austrian shipping container is now sideways. I was like, oh, and this is our, this is a lab in which we have our, you know, precious $30,000 entanglement source with a special crystal that generates entangled photons and um, you know, million, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of optics. And so we went out and took a look. And this is what we saw. Uh, just uh, you know, many months of work just down the drain here. Almost off the cliff, not just down the drain. Uh, you can sort of see it's hanging, it's, it's leaning on a handrail and had it just been shifted a few meters over, um, it would have toppled off the cliff completely. I wasn't sure if this container um, shifted and then tipped over, or if it rolled end over end in this windstorm. I think it just shifted and then tilted, uh, but it's sort of hard to tell from the aftermath, and I'll show you that. Um, so this was about 3 p.m. on December 15th, uh, and we were really lucky because it's the top of a mountain, and you know how are you going to deal with something like this on the edge of the mountain? It's clearly a safety hazard. The wind's still blowing um, at about you know, 100 kilometers per hour. But it turned out that there were some construction operators um, up on the mountaintop doing some service work on some of the other telescopes. And so they actually had a bulldozer, and they were able to pull the container down um, and hold it there for the night just by um, fastening it to the bulldozer. This happened at about midnight. Um, and so they actually pulled this container down, and then the wind gusted, and it sort of tipped over again. They pulled it down. This happened a few times. So they give, they give everything a really good shape. Um, uh, and so, you know, just to, you know, you know, they say entropy always increases, and uh, they increase by a lot, those several minutes. Um, the next day, we actually went into the container, saw the afternoon. By now, the windstorm had died down. Uh, so this is a remnant of that entanglement source. You can sort of see light streaming in here. This is actually outside the container. The container itself um, ruptured in several places. Um, so I mean, you can imagine like all these optics are sort of just shot. Um, you can see here what was inside the container after we sort of took everything out. Um, you can see there's a panel here on this table that once held our entanglement source, the entanglement source is sitting outside. But you can see that its corresponding panel on this side of the table is gone. It's actually leaning against the wall there, so the, the whole table actually just broke apart. Um, on the left here is a hobby telescope mount which held one of our hobby telescopes that we use for sending those entangled photons. Um, so this whole thing just, this you know, 40, 50 pound mount just smashed into a window, broke the glass. Um, uh, uh, we called the shipping container company the following day. Um, they were able to drive a truck up 
and they actually just lifted the whole container, um, put it back in its original spot, and brought some concrete blocks. I didn't think these concrete blocks existed except uh, like you know, in Bugs Bunny or like Tom and Jerry, or something. <laughs> but they actually exist. And they brought like four or five of these enormous weights and just uh, tied the container down. I mean, like this is like your quintessential concrete block that drops on, <laughs> drops on top of something. Else. And they just had these. And I was amazed by this. Um, you can see the little hole in our window here. It's actually boarded up because there's broken glass everywhere. Um, but this little hole there where, we're, where we normally point our telescope um, out towards the, uh, the receiving station. We brought all the optics back in. Um, actually, not that much stuff was damaged. We were, we were pleasantly surprised. We only broke one of our three um, lasers that we need to run the experiment. You can see us physically um, putting the container back together. I think he's like sealing one of the cracks in the one of the cracks in the walls here with just some tube of God knows what at the bottom of the island. Um, our new door handle uh, is just pieces of duct tape. You need to keep the door to the container closed because um, of the wind outside and also the temperature of the crystal you use to generate those entangled photons needs to be kept, kept uh, very constant to within about a tenth of a degree Celsius. And so if you have people opening and closing the door, you're going to get gusts of wind coming in and cooling down the crystal and then your feedback loop that heats up the crystal is going to overcompensate and it's going to kind of wriggle around. So you need to keep the temperature really stable. And so we did it with um, a couple pieces of duct tape. You can see the door doesn't actually fit in the door frame anymore. Um, and so this was, it, was, it was so much more fun working on this experiment after this happened because we would just have random solutions like that. Um, here's how we monitored leaks. We had, uh, we had some pieces of duct tape holding the bucket to the wall. Um, we didn't seal the container up correctly and, you know, Sometimes the water from outside condenses everywhere, um, and the roof actually had a kink in it. So when it hit the when it hit the railing, the the, the container buckled, and so all the water from the top of the container um, sort of drains right into our experiment. And so we just taped a bucket to the back of our the, our back wall and pointed a webcam at it and used um, used Team Viewer in order to monitor that bucket remotely. And so whenever, whenever the bucket got full, we would send someone out and they would just empty this bucket and take it back on. Um, so this was really, like, I, I felt like a cowboy or something, you know, just doing all these sorts of menial tasks and, like, you know, tweaking off. It's, it's very weird sort of mix of things we did. Um, eventually, we got everything fixed up. Uh, it was sort of a miracle. Um, we lost our entanglement, the little crystal that makes our entangled photons. So my advisor emailed all of his colleagues and said, anyone with another crystal um, can actually win a free trip to La Palma. And so someone bought another crystal, and we made the experiment happen. Um, this is a telescope operator room where uh, some of the people on our team um, saw first light with our random number generator. Um, this is the night of the experiment that happened. I think this was actually the night before. It was much less cloudy. Um, you can see one of our receiving stations here, that little, that little up there next to this big telescope building. Um, normally the cloud layer is lower than it is here, so that's, that's how we get observatory uh, the cloud tops. Um, here's a guide camera that we use. Um, so this light, the photons hitting this, um, this CCD, you know, are 8 billion years old, uh, and now we're using them as random bits to feed into a quantum entanglement experiment. Um, this is a view of our entanglement source uh, from one of the receiver stations. This green beacon here is, um, this is just a beacon laser so that we can point these two um, hobby telescopes at each other. And once we've sort of aligned them on each other and turned on the feedback loops, we can turn off that green laser and change out the fibers and send entangled photons over and still um, be reasonably sure that the, pho the photons aren't sort of locked up, to, the telescopes are locked up to each other. Can anyone guess what this um, giant glare here is over here? Like this is about 8 p.m. It is a moon. I, I was really surprised when I learned that. This is actually the moon rising, uh, but it, you can see how dark it is out here. Um, so, you know, it's just, we would always perform our experiments by night because our single photon detectors would just be overwhelmed by the oodles of solar photons that are flying around the daytime. Um, and in fact, our experiment was wildly successful. They actually made a PBS and NOVA documentary about it, um, which you're free to, go, free to go check out. Um, so that's sort of all I've got. Um, but if you're interested, I'm happy to take questions now about any of the physics, any about the quantum stuff, any of the astronomy, um, even questions of the documentary. I only show up for two seconds. 
which I think is an ideal amount of time to show up in the document. That's all I got. Thanks for having me. So you're using the quasars as a random uh, photon number generator, single photon. Right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything, they're very far away, is there anything in the intervening space between you and the quasar that makes it non-random? Uh, something that causes polarization or you know, just traversing all of that intergalactic space? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's actually one of the strongest assumptions that we have to make in doing this experiment. That those photons, that their energy didn't change from the time that they leave the, they leave the quasar on the way to Earth. Because it's ultimately the energy of each individual photon that tells us whether we're getting a, a zero or a one. Uh, and so if you believe in energy conservation, which I certainly do, even if I don't, even if I don't believe in quantum mechanics, I still believe in energy conservation. Uh, and so that's why I believe that we can assume that these photons coming towards us um, have colors that are determined at the time of emission rather than by something in between, you know, in the interstellar medium or something on the way to Earth. And, and these are infrared photons because they've been redshifted over that distance or they're visible at They're actually sort of set, centered at 700 nanometers. Um, this turns out to be a good spot because there's less light pollution there and I think you cut out um, a good portion of the near infrared band. So you're looking at 700 to 800 nanometers and like 500 to 700, I think, is your blue band. But yes, these are like, these are like I mean, these quasars in their rest frames emit lots of ultraviolet photons, which get redshifted by a factor of three or four because they're redshifted. <coughs> I saw that hand back there first. So um, you had mentioned that the experiment was in the end successful. Um, so in like a sentence, what exactly have you just solidified our quantum theories? Like what exactly does this experiment, you know, in a sentence done? This experiment has confirmed the predictions of quantum mechanics while simultaneously removing uh, the assumption that um, Alice's, Alice's photon can predict Bob's, how Bob's the number generator is going to come out, uh, which is a reasonable assumption a priori but when you look at it on that space-time diagram, remember I showed those purple regions um, intersecting just four milliseconds before you started the experiment. Um, a priori, it seems like a reasonable assumption, but if you just look at this, how the space-time um, geometry works out, it'd be really nice to remove that assumption that there's any sort of causal contact between your lab on Earth and how you put the reporters, which we have sorts of the cosmos. Yeah, Why is it necessary to use it almost 8 billion year old random <coughs> generator. Why, why not use a computer to generate random? Yes, I had a slide about that. Yeah. So instead of the 90 pictures as follows, uh, I sort of went through this a little quickly. Um, but on this diagram, we have time scrolling forward and space on the x, the x axis here. Um, any event, this previous one, this is a anything in this red, in this red triangle here, could have affected how Alice's, um, how Alice's photon was created. Uh, and anything <coughs> in this blue oh, region here could have influenced how Bob's random number generator was uh, decided. And so, anything in the intersection can influence both. And if you can influence both, then you can explain quantum correlations without using quantum theory. And this purple region extends just four milliseconds before your experiment starts. Uh, and so one could ask that, well, you know, every experiment done to test Bell's inequality um, to date has used random number generator, random numbers generator on a computer or by something in the lab. But you know, you could have you could have just had four milliseconds of advanced warning and you could reproduce all the, all the correlations that you see in quantum mechanics without quantum mechanics if you just need a four millisecond head start. And so in our experiment, we've pushed this to 10 billion years. You need a 10 billion year head start in order to fake quantum mechanics. Uh, the quasars that you used, um, 
you obviously selected them with great care. And are you planning on using some other quasar surgeons <laughs> to further verify, or is, you know, are you satisfied with the results? So it's a little bit difficult to do better than we did, okay. um, because as you look to far look back to you know deeper and deeper redshifts, as these phases get farther and farther away, they get dimmer. Um, and if they get too dim, then the problem then like if you see ten photons in your detector, a smaller fraction of those ten photons are going to come from that phase. You're going to get a higher and higher fraction from local sky noise, um, and those are just local quarter flips. Um, and you need a sufficiently high fraction of cosmic quarter flips in order to um, distinguish between uh, who win this game at all. So we were thinking of maybe using the cosmic microwave background as a source of random bits for this. But it turns out that the signal-to-noise ratio of the cosmic microwave background is too low, even if you go out in space and point a balloon um, at the best observing frequency. Um, the signal-to-noise ratio is still about one to one, and that's not enough. You need, I think, at minimum, like 60-something percent um, in order to tell the difference at all. <coughs> I mean, it essentially comes down to the fact that with classical physics, you can get 75%. You don't need all that much cheating to get to 85%. And so um, you want to, and that the amount of cheating you have is proportional to how much, um, how many local quarter flip, how many local quarters are being flipped. And so you can't have many of those. There's a quantum entanglement. I know China. Uh, last year, the year before, lofted a military communication satellite that uses QE principles. Is your impression that, that the advantage of doing that is that it makes the code unbreakable, or that it lets you know if someone has broken or has access to the content of the communication, or is it something else? I think the question was in reference to um, a satellite called Quantum Experiment at Space Scale which was launched by the Chinese Space Agency in 2016 um, to demonstrate, do similar tests to what we've been doing here. Um, they have a satellite with one of these um, special crystals on it that emits entangled photons. Um, and they have two ground stations um, separated by thousands of kilometers where they do similar tests of quantum entanglement. And they can also demonstrate quantum communication. Um, and one reason that quantum communication is really interesting is because it's certifiable even if you don't trust the satellite. Because what you can do is you can certify the presence of entanglement by playing exactly this game. If you see 85%, then you know that regardless of who made the satellite, it's giving you real entanglement. Um, and if you're seeing real entanglement, you can use that to do things um, like quantum key distribution. Uh, and you can do that even without trusting um, trusting the, the satellite. Uh, and so that's why people are really excited about <coughs> this satellite, because it's sort of different from every other cryptographic thing you could come up with. It really relies on just the laws of physics, which you can sort of trust. Um, so that's another reason why pushing pushing these tests to their most, you know, these rigorous, you know, under these rigorous experimental conditions is interesting because, you know, now you're sure that there's no way that this Chinese satellite could be faking quantum um, by somehow predicting what you're doing locally. And this is admittedly sort of overkill, but we don't think there's a mechanism by which you can you know, get a head start and predict how the entangled photon is going to be emitted, and also how one of the quarters is going to be flipped. But it's a test that's worth doing, um, and we did. What is the, the four milliseconds represented? Like? What, what, what is that? <laughs> yeah, so this. So the four milliseconds is how much time you need to go between, um, uh, I think it's, it's proportional to how much time you need to communicate between um, Alice's photon being made and also wherever Bob's random bit is being generated. So you can send a signal to both places. You need a four millisecond head start. <coughs> send a photon in two directions. And if you do that four milliseconds before you start your experiment, then you can commu then you can sort of tip off Alice how Bob random number generator is going to be made, and then you can fake 
quantum mechanics. So then far enough apart that it takes four milliseconds to communicate? Yeah, so the biggest experiments ever done um, were actually performed by that Chinese team that launched the satellite. They had a baseline of several thousand kilometers, and so that's about four flight At the speed of light, correct? Yeah, it's just the speed of light. So, so the red dot, sorry, that's the present, right? And below the red dot is the past, and above it is the future. It's like, like uh, yeah? Yes. Exactly. So, so, so it's the four milliseconds in, in, in the past. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is a, this is a deep cause of the past. This is just before you perform your experiment. And when the red dot happens, that's when your entangled photons are created. Um, and presumably, there, you know, there could have been something slightly before those photons were created that told the laser how to you know, or told the crystal how to make those photons <coughs> that would help the, those photons win the game. And simultaneously, mm -hmm. that could have told the props of the number generator to come out of heads or tails. You know, that's pretty good. So, my question is, I wanted just a verification, because no one knows the possible mechanism that that could occur, right? That you're just, you're just, this, I mean, that, that signaling, that, that uh, tipping off Alice's, or creating that photon, and also tipping off, creating a random bit. But nobody knows what that mechanism would be. You're just ruling it out. That, okay, it could happen. By hook or crook, you don't know how. It could happen within the, within the theory of relativity then. Exactly. Right, I see. The only thing we assume for these experiments is that you can't send information faster than light. And from that assumption, you can rule out this broad class of theories which allow you know, this sort of signaling to take place. Does, does anybody have any idea how that could happen, though? Um, not really. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but too late, we ruled it out. All right. So. <laughs> Just uh, out of curiosity, 7.78 million years ago, how close were those radars to each other? To each other. Yeah. How small was the universe at that point? I think it's about a tenth of its current size. Yeah. Still pretty big. Yeah. It's pretty big. So um, supposedly far enough apart so they can't talk. Yeah. So that's a really great point. And so we have to have two quasars. The nearer one is about 8 billion light years away. The other one is about 12. Um, and so it turns out that with those numbers, these two purple regions actually do overlap a little bit. Um, the <coughs> sun universe is sort of, um, it's a little bit tricky because everything sort of comes back to one point at the Big Bang. Yeah, um, yeah. But the past light cones of those two quasars actually does overlap, I think, at a point like 13 billion years ago or something. Okay. Um, and that region corresponds where they, those past light cones overlap, corresponds to just 4% of the visible universe. And so whatever conspiracy is existing has to have lived in that 4% of the universe, um, the, you know, the, the, the volume of the universe, um, in order to explain our results with some uh, non-quantum theory that no one has come up with, but that people already ruled out. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? If no, I, I want to thank Calvin again for a great talk. tonight. It's a great, great night. I did want, I have two things to say. First off, um, uh, Alan Takeda put together a newsletter this month, as he does every month, and he does a fantastic job, and I wanted to recognize him, just like Roger, I wanted to do. It's a tremendous amount of work and a lot of patience he has to exercise with people that submit articles, so I thank you again. Um, the second thing is Chris has provided uh, refreshments tonight and in addition to his work as a membership secretary and uh, filming our events so thank you for that Chris so uh, with that I'll call on the end of the meeting thank you very much thank you. Thank you.